welcome everybody. Um, the idea for this is not to scare you, but to educate you. So we're gonna try and just run through um, just some things that happens on the internet for you to just be aware of, um, some things you take for granted on your social media. And at the end, um, just for us to have a chat, if you have time for you to ask any questions that I can answer, and if I can't answer it, I know the Love of Humans over by Greek will make sure that you get the info. So just, I'm gonna say I'm required to just show you this. I don't have to read it. <laughs> just to say that, I mean, I work with an organization. So this is all in my personal capacity. Um, what's happening in the internet? So just in a minute on the internet in 2020, you realize how much time that person spend online. Um, just in Netflix alone, like an average user spent 404,000 hours online. Um, there were several apps in a second, 2,700 apps in a second is downloaded. 319 new persons sign on to Twitter in a second. 500 hours of videos are uploaded by users in a second. Um, 41.7 million messages are shared in WhatsApp alone in a second. So you have an idea that pretty much we're super hyper-connected. And because of that, um, there's been attacks. Like some of you would see some of it in the news. You'd have heard that Facebook was hacked. You'd hear that Twitter gets hacked and everybody's like, what is this hack? What does this mean for me? I think the important thing is that for you to be educated on what are these attackers looking for? And that's our goal for today. So pretty much at the end of this session that you will be equipped with knowledge, knowledge that you can share with friends, knowledge that you can use for yourself their main goal when they decide to do an attack is information. Like almost everything that we see from where we sit, it's information, information, information. And guess who's the holder of the information? You. You are the chief information officer for your house. You are the chief in charge of securing yourselves. You are pretty much an IT tech without realizing it because you use technology. You have a computer, you have a cell phone. Some of you have smart TVs. How are people being attacked nowadays? It's everywhere. So pretty much when you're at your work, you have to be thinking about this because it's your office that's at risk. You have to think about yourself, your personal life. People can pretty much, I wanna show you what people look for in various, the idea of the presentation is to show you the different tools that you use and what people are looking for and how you can better protect yourself in your personal life and just in your daily environment. Once you go to Starbucks or any coffee shop, where's the free Wi-Fi? And that's the first thing you're logging on to. You go to the airport, where's the free Wi-Fi? You're sitting on a promenade, where's the free Wi-Fi? So we're constantly in the environment also looking for access to the internet. What are people looking for when they actually start to target you as an individual? They're looking for the websites you're looking at. They're looking at your IP addresses. What type of businesses? What are the phone numbers? Who you work with? Who you work for? Um, and where are they looking for this? They're looking at your pictures. Many of us, when we take these photos and we're like on Instagram saying, hey, it always has a location in it. Like things that you don't normally just disable when you have a new phone. Those are the things that they're looking for. Um, some of us go to cafes and we search personal stuff online and we're like typing in so many things and in the search engine, we didn't clear it. Um, we go on our Facebook, we go on YouTube and log into our YouTube account and we're like inside jamming in the cafe on our personal YouTube account and not even realizing that people are looking at these things when you walk away from the machine. Um, how much information can they get from you? So you see my nice little lady, I hope, and you recognize that just this one little lady, um, there's so much information you can grab from just her alone. Um, just her profile alone, you can grab her name, her address, the satellite view of where she's located because of course she wants her friends to know that she's here and she shared a location with her boyfriend because he's tracking her and he wants to know where she's at at any given time. Your citizenship, some of us have very political views and on Twitter we're like saying, I don't like this party and you're like putting all that data out there. Um, just your environment, your kids use your laptop. Your kids use your laptop and they're going into their um, information, your coworkers, um, persons of interest that you follow on Twitter, on Instagram. People can tell who you are just by what you express on social media. Your lifestyle, Amazon tracks your purchases and any other company that sells you stuff online, um, they're tracking what you purchase. 
Um, your financials, some of us have online banking, we have our vacation stuff. Um, your geolocation, when you have it on your phone because you're either using some app that requires this. So what we want you to kind of open up when you leave here, as I said, is not to feel scared, it's to feel empowered because now you know what they're looking for, where they're looking for it, and you know where you need to close the shop so they can't get that data. So social engineering, what is it? Social engineering is what you do when you forget your keys and you're trying to get into your office and you walk up to the person at the front desk and you're like, um, I kind of forgot my key. And they're like, who are you? Um, don't you remember me? Like, I came here like a minute ago and you, you gave me my hotel room key. I went to the beach and I lost it. That's social engineering, but it's done online. Um, they do the same thing. They try to get to know you. Some of it, they get to know by a phone call, sending you an email. So they use the same tricks and trade you use in person. Like you're in a bad spot with your boss and you know your boss like kids. You're like, um, I'm late for work because my kids were sick and I couldn't get there on time. And you manipulate your boss. That's the same kind of stuff they do online. The number one success factor is they make you trust them online. COVID. There was so much information being shared during COVID that we didn't even think about like, oh my gosh, there's a disease that you walk into a building and like, can I have your name? Can I have your address? Can I have your phone number? Can I check your temperature? Can I have your signature? They take all this data from you just because there's a crisis as well. And you, you haven't even thought to yourself like, where's this data being saved? What's happening to the information I've shared? You are the owner of your data. It's something that I take very personal. When I post pictures of my kids, I don't. If it's on WhatsApp as my profile pic, it's always the back of their heads. You can't tell who they are, like ever. It's either a shadow or the back of their, like keep in mind that you're the owner of your data and your kids' data for those who have kids, your nieces, your nephews, your grandkids. You're the owner of their data. And guess what? Data is gold. What's the information that's on Google, for example? You realize if you even Google right now, Terry, you're at the top of my screen. So if I Google your name, you'll pop up. You either pop up in a social media, your email address. What's even important is sometimes the documents we save online from our companies. If I type your name plus PDF, it actually pops up. Um, those of us who live in more developed countries, it actually has um, these websites that gather data about you and your phone number, your last known address, all of that pops up when you type your name. The other day it was so weird for me. I kept getting an email saying that I owe a library book. I don't even go to the library. And when I Googled the person that they were looking for, her address was in the email they were sending me. So I was able to look for her name, her address and find out who this person was that was Carrie Ann Barrett who owed a library book. It turned out she actually had a criminal record as well. And I was like, oh crap. They could think it's me. <laughs> and it just shows you that when people start to put bits and pieces about your personality online, they can know so much about you on Google. I don't know this person, but I already know her address. I know her name. I know that she has a criminal record. I know which library she goes to. And chances are it could be the books that she rented from the library was GED, meaning that she's studying to do her high school diploma. I know all of that from her, from just Googling. Um, so keep in mind that the data that you share is completely accessible online. For those of us who work in companies, some of the documents we save are accessible online. Um, persons can find it by looking for the institutional name. They can see what documents are associated. They can know which user has been saving the documents. Um, in Gmail, Gmail also stores the same kind of data. So kind of just think about how you save and do certain tips I'm going to give you later in terms of protecting this. Um, if you share, save your pictures with Gmail, if it is that you store and have all your contacts saved in Gmail. Um, those of us who have Apple phones, if it's synced on the cloud, all your contacts are there. Just think about all of those information or where it's stored. And I have persons who are in tech, um, like my brother-in-law is information security, and he uses technology 100%. He saves everything online. So there's no fear in doing it. It's just that if you do it, keep in mind that it's there and make sure that you put the measures in place to protect it. How can you improve your Gmail security then? Um, make sure that you have some two-factor authentication built in. Um, it gives the option on the app. It gives the option in the computer. Look at the connected devices based on where you access your Gmail. 
um, activate some of the security features in your account and look out for identity fraud, mail spoofing. People send you emails to your Gmails all the time. Just don't click it. If you did not send a package, there's no way DHL should be sending you an email that a package is on the way. FedEx should not be saying, please click here if you want to verify or sign in for this document because nobody sent you a document by FedEx. Um, your aunt should not magically have inherited funds and you're now, of course, we all want to be a millionaire. I've been trying to win the lotto, but chances are if you had an aunt who was a billionaire and is now leaving you monies, they wouldn't be contacting you through your Gmail randomly. They'll probably find a better way to reach you through an attorney, for example. Um, in terms of Twitter, those of us who use Twitter, um, just keep in mind that Twitter covers and in that you can actually see all the devices that you use to access Twitter. You can see that you're accessing it from your phone, from your tablet, from your computer. Twitter, if persons look at your profile, they can see all your close friends if it's something that you use to communicate with your friends. Um, the topics of interest, the things that you tweet about, the things that you follow on Twitter, the hashtags that you use, um, where you're located, if you have that activated, people think about that and they look at it and are like, hmm, I can actually see what Shireen is doing and I can know that she is actually here because she just tweeted about that awesome cup of coffee that she just had. Um, so think about those mm -hmm. things. <laughs> um, the other thing that there, there are certain tools that people use, and this is just for you to know that people do want to know. You have guys who are tracking girls, girls who are tracking guys, and these free tools are available online and they can use it to check your Twitter account. Um, so just keep in mind that these things are free, they're on YouTube, and the more you put in is the more that people can get out. So just always be mindful what you post. How to improve your security on Twitter then? Um, Verify your authentication and you'll see a similar um, tips for all of these things that I'm going to tell you about. Check your location and option for your tweets. Do you want people to know where you're tweeting from all the time? It just takes a few minutes you check in the security, privacy and security option in your tweet account and looking at location and disabling it. Um, keep in mind that you can choose also whether you're visible or not visible to everyone. You can limit who you're visible to. Um, also check photo tagging if you've enabled it or if it's disabled so persons can not tag you um, and report a tweet if it's abusive. It's one of the things that Twitter is actually pretty good at where if you report it and they can prove it's abusive, they'll take the tweet down. The famous WhatsApp that all of us have, there's so many things that have happened through WhatsApp recently. Um, there's been some account hijacking where persons can actually take your accounts by sending you a text or a message through it and you're clicking it through WhatsApp. Um, espionage, some persons have experienced persons just taking over their WhatsApp account and checking what information is shared through it. And malware distribution, which is just like if you think about um, like a virus that's sent through WhatsApp, some of those forwards that people send all the time, some of those videos that they send all the time and you're like, oh my gosh, and you're just clicking the video and just forwarding it automatically to your friends. Like every time my mom, she's like in her 80s and she sends me a video, I was like, mom, did you click? And she's like, I can't understand why my phone isn't working. I was like, your phone isn't working because it's probably filled with spyware. <laughs> like stop clicking the videos. She's like, but my friends send me the videos. Stop clicking every video that comes to you. Um, there's so much that can happen through that. Um, so some things that we want you to consider for this is think before sharing something. Um, not because your friend shared it means that it's good. Um, the video might be really interesting. Maybe it may look really good, but consider before you share. Um, add greater controls for your, for your WhatsApp. Um, activate two-factor authentication. It's, it, it's a common thing. One of the things that technologists have been doing for us is given us the tools, but what they're not doing is making it a default feature. So that they're giving you the good things to do, but they're not telling you how to do it at the same time. So it really requires you just spending some time in your security and actually activating this. Um, so what's our privacy tips? It's really easy to find. Just go into settings, go into account. You can enable these things, um, check your two-step verification, changing your numbers, request account info, delete your account. All this is included in your settings. So just take some time and go into it. 
And just do some checks tonight. When you're lying down, you can't sleep. Just go through all your settings in your phone and in all these apps that you have on it. Um, another thing that you can look at is your privacy. You can actually um, take a note that you want to have security notifications if something happens. And you can also send that to them. And when possible, um, the messages that you send and the calls can be secured. Ensure that you enable that, because um, that will allow you to get some security um, information from them. What about your passwords? And this is where an interesting um, question comes up. We're going to actually think about how safe is your password? You can't have a cheese doodles lock in a door. Um, it's going to break and you're going to get in through the door. Having your username as admin and your password as admin is so default on your routers. And it's important for you to think about how safe this is. A cheese doodles can protect you as good as it tastes. Um, we're actually going to um, do a poll right now. Um, the poll is up. And um, just for you to probably just answer really quickly, what are some of the top pins um, from these four that you think um, persons use? And then the next slide, I'm actually going to share with you um, some answers that came up. All right, we have 90% of the persons here actually voting. So I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. A majority of you actually believe that one, two, three, four is one of the top passwords and zero, zero, zero. And to answer this, you are correct. Zero, zero, zero actually comes number three um, in the top 10 passwords used. And believe it or not, people use these easy passwords they actually believe that because they don't want to forget, they do something that's really simple. And I'm really bad, I write everything down. So I actually have a book. If I lose that book, I lose my life because I don't use anything. I, I try not, I always try to make all my passwords different. And you can't remember a million passwords, but it's important to actually think about the fact that these passwords are not secure. And we're gonna do one more poll. In terms of which age group you actually think recycle their passwords more. So we're always talking about Generation Z, next gen, millennials. And in terms of the age group, which ones you believe recycle their passwords the most? There are 40% who've answered. So we'll keep going until we have most of you replying. Nobody believes the 65 so far recycles. That's pretty good. <laughs> we have 70%. We're going to give it a few more seconds and then just see we're at 80%. Yep, we're at 90%. All right, so we can end the poll. So a majority of you actually believe that the 50 to 64 generation um, recycles their password more. Um, and an average amount believes that the other age groups don't. So we're going to actually look at the results now. Um, in a global study, they actually realized that the persons who recycle their passwords more are the younger generation. Um, it's kind of crazy that the 18 to 24 year olds are the ones who recycle the most. The older folks tend not to recycle and they're probably like me, they write everything down and they try to make it complex. And it's not so much that they're making complex passwords, but it could be that they're just trying to ensure they don't use the same passwords. So that was a good, a good thing to think about. And we're going to go into some tips for this. Um, there's some things that we recommend. The use of passwords alone is a no-no. Um, the use of password and two-factor authentication via SMS, it's kind of okay. But if you remember, when you send the text, oftentimes you see it pop up at the top automatically when that verification comes. So what we also recommend as like a real thumbs up is using a single password two-factor authentication app. Um, if you have a multi-authentication factor, that's even better for you. And that would mean for those of you who may not be that tech savvy, it's you actually have apps that will generate and protect the apps that you use. So you could have that as an additional layer of security. 
If you do the two factor, that's the minimum. Just make sure that you do that at least by SMS, by email, just ensure that you can get some amount of verification before someone gets into your apps. What does this look like? Um, for two-factor authentication, it's usually something you know and something you have. So for example, you may have a PIN, which you know, and something you have is that they can send you some verification to your phone or to your laptop. So that's how two-factor authentication works. Um, the, the SMS, as I said, this option isn't recommended because the code actually jumps up on your screen automatically when you send it. And sometimes you don't even have to like write it down. It automatically pastes itself into the app. So what we recommend is if you can get an additional app that actually generates your passwords or secure your passwords, it's actually a good thing to invest in. Some of them are free that are actually recommended and you can actually just download them and see how they work. Um, and it may be better for you. Um, be aware um, that ransomware, for example, exists. Ransomware, you'll probably hear it on the TV, on the news that um, the hospital has been hacked and they've locked up their data. So ransomware is pretty much, they, they're robbing you <laughs> through the computer without you even knowing. They're holding you at gunpoint because they know that you need this information and they're saying, pay us to get that info. So the bottom line is they would usually inject a code into whatever it is. Um, they would kidnap your data and they'll just wait for payment. So they're just saying to you that, hey, I have it. I've had it locked up. If you want it back, you need to pay for it. Um, there's a lot of ransomware that's happened and don't think that if it ever happens to you that it's something that is unique to you. It usually comes through an email link, an email attachment. You would see some random persons telling you, um, please find attached the invoice that you need. And you'd be like, invoice, what's that invoice? And you click it because you're, you're wondering if you forgot to pay something. Chances are, if you had an invoice, you would, you would know about it. Um, some of them send it to say, hey, there's a shipment bill that something's been posted to you. Can you click here to check? Another common thing they do is they will email you from your friend's address. So Maxine, they will say, hey, um, this is your friend, Maxine. Um, I sent you a picture. Can you look at it really quick? But when you click on Maxine's email, if you right click on it, you'll see that it's not Maxine's email address. You don't know that email. And it's like from Maxine Barnett, Barrett, like my name instead of Barnett. And it's just one slight letter that's in here like, why Maxine spelled her name wrong? Um, there was a friend of mine in Trinidad who he traveled, we all knew that he was away, but then every single one of his friends got a text message, um, not as a ransomware, but just as a, as a phishing, saying that we needed to send him money because he was lost. And we're all like calling each other, we're like, is he okay, is he okay? And then he finally got access to his account. He's like, it's not me. <laughs> he didn't pay a ransom for it, but he finally got a way to get into the account. Um, some of you are business persons, and I thought this, attack was important for you to know because you represent your companies in some shape or form. Um, there's something called a BC attack where they actually target the business executives and CEOs. Um, the reason why they target these people is because your CEO, your chief accountant, these are the persons who actually own the data for your company. They are the gatekeepers. And what they usually do is they, they fish them the same way. They will send an email link. They will stalk them in their social media. They will send them an email attachment or even say to them that, hey, chief, this invoice needs payment. This payment needs approval or we're running payroll. And they'll send it to them for approval and they'll click on it. Um, a lot of it comes with invoices as well that will come to you as an individual, as a staff, as an employee. And you would actually send this and it would actually lock the account for your chief. And then they end up having to wait to pay to get access to their account. Um, it usually costs a lot of money to your company. So I'm just flagging this for you to think that your CEOs, if you have friends who are CEOs, who are CIOs, who are chief financial officers or just accountants, just keep in mind that these guys are the ones that they target. And if you can give them the tips as well, just to be very secure in how they access this data, you'll save their companies a lot of money. Um, I'm going to wrap up. So at least we'll have some time to talk with some recommendations for you. Um, update regularly. Um, sometimes we don't have the time because updates always 
come when you're about to do something. It always comes as soon as you open Microsoft, it pops up and you're like, oh, I need to do this document. And you click, remind me later, remind me later, remind me later. Take some time and actually update. Um, one of the things that you need to look at once you hear that your account is compromised, like sometimes Gmail or somebody might send you an email that it thinks your account is compromised, change your password. If you went somewhere and logged into your account and you think that um, it's compromised, make sure you do that. So update your passwords when you can. Use complex sentences, we call it, but it's with pretty much complex passwords. So instead of doing um, coffee, hashtag 2019, think of something. Persons know that you drink coffee. Like everybody knows I drink coffee. My sister got this cup for me because it says I'm crabby until I get my coffee. Like people know that some persons might say, oh, her, her password might be Starbucks because she loves coffee or she might be coffee. Um, another thing that you could think about is not to recycle your passwords because you may have used it for your banking. Then you said, okay, I'm gonna change my password. I'm gonna use the same one for my email. Let me use the one from my workplace because I had to change that one. Once they find some of your passwords, they can run with them and use them. Um, Another thing that you have to think about is your two-factor authentication. Just make sure you avoid using SMS if you can. Um, there are some free tools I listed for here that you could consider to use as an app. There's a Google Authenticator you could use. <coughs> Microsoft also offers an authenticator for free. Um, there's something called Authy that you could check out. And there's something called Free OTP that you could check out. So those four apps are free they could supplement what you're doing for your two-factor. And never, I mean, this is from my tech guy and he always does this and I always change back to HTML, but he always says that with your password, never leave it as something plain. Um, never leave it as something that is so basic. Always try to put something that is not very straightforward. So for example, um, think about passwords that, um, not only that you won't remember, but something that someone can't even think that would be associated with you. Um, some password um, apps that you could consider is KeePass, um, One Password, LastPass, and Dashlane. They offer some basic security for free. You don't have to do a subscription immediately. And at least if you like them, um, you can then decide um, what you do from there. Um, I hope I didn't speak too fast, but I know that um, we, we wanted us to make sure that we have some time to talk and chat. If you have any questions, and um, on that note, I want to tell you thanks, merci, gracias, obrigado. Um, and I'm going to hand back over to Liana. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much, Carrie Ann. That was very informative. I'm sure everyone will agree. Um, we have a question from Terry. It was the first question. So Terry, um, would you like to ask the question yourself? Sure. I was just curious what your recommendation would be as far as for the best way to clear our history on both our smartphones and our laptop or um, desktop. So it's so I think the first thing is there's something called cache, C-A-C-H-E. That's where all the data is stored for this. Um, so on your laptop, if you actually go, if you're using Microsoft um, Ex Internet Explorer, or even Google Chrome, if you go to the settings, let me try and walk you through one of them. At least I can um, tell you in real time. So in Chrome, you'll realize there are three little dots on the right-hand side. If you click on that and you go down to the option that says um, history, Mm -hmm. and you go across the history and click on history, there's actually on the left-hand side something called clear browsing data. And the only thing that you have to keep in mind is that once you click that, any passwords you'd have put into a website, um, it will clear everything as well um, because the browsing history would include some of the passwords you've put in um, and anything like that. If you look above it, it says tabs from other devices. So if you have your devices actually linked, it can clear the history from there as well. Okay. Um, another thing that you can consider is that when you go down to settings in it, um, you'll see in it something called privacy and security. So the three little dots, and I don't know if I can share my screen. Let me see if I could share my screen here, hold on. 
can see if it will come up. Okay, there we go. Can you see it? Uh -huh. So when you go, let me go back. So when you click here, the three little dots, you go to okay. settings, settings pop up. On the left hand side, you see privacy and security mm -hmm. and the options for clear history. So the cookies is what stores your password. So like you type into multiple websites and you're typing your passwords and it's saving it every time you go on the website, it automatically logs you in. Those are the cookies. The cache, the C-A-C-H-E, those are like you going to multiple pages. So in Chrome, in Internet Explorer or Firefox, whatever you use, it actually stores all the websites that you visited for the day, for the month, for the year. Um, so you can delete this. The other cookies that are third party are the ones that would go on a website and would say, hey, we track, we track, um, we, we might say at the bottom, hey, we do cookies. And you can either accept or not accept. And it will track you every time you go on a website. So, so for example, you Google the handbag and you notice that every time you pop on another website, you've seen an ad for that handbag that you Google on another page. Those are the cookies that follow you. So you can clear all of that through here. Okay. Um, one of the things that I always do um, just so you know, Terry, is whenever I go on, um, I'm doing something that's secure enough and I don't want anyone to know, or if I'm forced to log into a website and I'm not at home, when I go here, there's an option that says incognito window. And this automatically, Chrome does not save your browsing history cookies or anything when you log on. So it's not, the, it's not the number one secure option, but it's one of the security things I do when I'm forced to log into somewhere that I don't feel comfortable using a friend's laptop or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Would this be uh, also applicable for Apple products, you know, that use Safari? You'd have to go, yep. When you go into Safari, there's a similar option in settings that you'd be able to clear. Okay, wonderful. And the same would be true on your phone? Your phone, you'd have to go into the settings options and okay. in the settings options, when you go to where the, the whatever browser that you use, mm -hmm. it should be able to give you an option to clear history. As Similar. Well. Very mm -hmm. well. That's incredibly helpful. Thank you. Anytime. And that actually frees up a lot of memory on your computer, believe it or not. Like if you haven't done it in 10 years and you've had this machine, like I've had one of my machines for almost 18 years and it got, it got so bogged down, I eventually just cleared it and started <laughs> from scratch because sometimes it's really hard to track down everywhere that you have that kind of cache state. Um, Liana, back to you. So guys, feel free to ask um, your questions directly to carry on. Anyone has an, any other questions for her? You could just um, unmute and go ahead. So hi, Kerry. Uh, uh, so my question would be, how safe is it to store our passwords in our e-wallets on our phones? And uh, especially like, you know, on Apple devices, you store it on your e-wallet, you know, it kind of takes it across your Apple devices. If you have a phone, an iPad and a uh, mm -hmm. MacBook. So, you know, it, it's easy, but how safe is it? Um, it's as safe as you secure your device. So pretty much Apple would do that security almost in the back end for all of their devices that you save across. But let's say you don't activate all the security features on your phone. So for example, whether you use facial recognition, still use two factor to get into your phone, whether or not for some of your other apps that you activate those security features on it. So if someone gets to your phone or your other device, they can't get into your password, that's as secure as it is. You still have to do some work. So for example, I lost my phone last week and all my apps were activated. But one of the things that was on my apps, some of my apps were two-factor tied to my laptop, so if, to my email, so if they got in, my Gmail was also there. So one of the things we had to do, I had to just erase the phone, like because at the end of the day, even though I had a password protection to get into it, there's ways to pretty much brute force to get into an Apple phone if they want to. So it's as secure as you make your phone <clears throat> because if they, if they get through the first gate, they'll get to your wallet too. As they get to your wallet, they'll get to everything across. Thank you. That's very helpful. And so then I'm just curious. So you cleared your phone remotely? You just. Yeah. I mean, once you have an Apple, you can go into the Apple cloud and you can erase their entire phone. So it should be inoperable to whoever did it. Um, but you'd have once you erase it. I mean, it's no use to you if you find it back. <laughs> but 
in my case, the person had turned the phone off almost immediately. It was like within a space of three minutes, the phone fell out of the car and somebody phoned it and they turned it off. So it was like that quick. Um, but one of the things that I learned from that, like, as I said, as much as I'm in tech, I like cybersecurity. I'm so anti a lot of these things, like for Facebook, I don't have a Facebook account because I think Facebook is too intrusive. Like they, they take your data and I don't like the fact that they take your data and sell it. So it's, it's what, it's, so one of the things I always tell people is what's your tolerance for how much data you have out there and what people are doing with it. Um, I think the, the main lesson I want to probably to take out of this is you are the chief information officer for your, for your data. And think about yourself in that capacity because your data is gold. All these institutions are making money from you with the recent thing with WhatsApp and privacy where they're telling you that they're now linked to Facebook. And you're like, okay, but I don't have a Facebook. So why would I want you to be sharing data with Facebook? It's thinking about these things and it's recognizing that the world is going to get to be one big mush anyway, eventually. It's just how slowly you, inc you incorporate yourself into that and how securely you do it. So it's just to think about the thing. It's not to be, to be more savvy, not to be more inhibited about engaging on the apps or anything like that. Thank you so much, Carrie ann for your time. Um, are there, do we have any more questions from the audience? Thank you. Um, actually, I, I have a question. Um, Carrie ann in terms of um, accepting cookies, like for example, if you want to read an article and the site says that you, know, you need to accept the cookies, how, how safe is that or is that, or that, is that something that you shouldn't do? I usually don't. I usually try to just scroll past it, <laughs> like not touch it, <laughs> because once you accept it, what you don't know, um, is it Viveke? Or, yeah? Um, yeah, Viveke. Be back. What you don't know is what they're doing with the cookies or what the cookies are doing in the background. So there are times when I accidentally click it and I do what I told to Terry, I automatically go to clear browser and clear cookies in, in like almost immediately. Um, because sometimes the cookies trail you with you throughout. So if you think about a cookie crumb, that's what it really is. If you think about cookies as in literal cookie crumbs. So what they do is that you, you bite that cookie and you're walking away with a cookie and every site that you visit after that, there's a trail from that cookie on those sites tracking you everywhere you go. So the idea of it is that they can trace you back. So if it is that you can avoid it, do. And when you can't, just make sure that you clear your browsing history. Um, oftentimes the cookies don't come with like a virus or malware, but it's pretty much similar to how a spyware is where it just sits on your system and it tracks what you do. And the idea is that you really don't want anybody following you. You just don't know what they're doing with your data. Okay, thank you very much. Anytime. Hi, can I ask a question? Hi, Kim, sure. Um, when you clear your phone, you said that it clears passwords and everything for your apps. If we've got face identity, would it clear that as well? Would we have to reset that? Um, but when I say clear your phone in terms of the question that Terry asked, where you clear your browsing history, because that would be different from resetting your phone. So what okay. Terry was asking is in relation to um, like those apps that you use to browse online. So like your Google, your Firefox, your Safari, your Internet Explorer. So that is where we were clearing the history from, not from your entire phone. Kim, are you there? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, just want to make sure because one of the things that you would want to do is um, the when I spoke about erasing my phone is when I lost it completely. So that's what we're talking about. And you wouldn't want to do that still, yeah? Um, Carrie, I actually have a question. Um, I'm just like you. I write my passwords down in a book and I actually watch the book every night. I go to sleep and think, if this goes missing, I'm not sure what um, will happen to me. So um, uh, I'm not sure about the apps that you can store your passwords on. Would you recommend that? Um, have you have had experience using it where you actually um, save your passwords on the app and you could go in on it and, you know, retrieve them easily? Um, I have. Uh, there's one that I use for work because I have to call Dashlane. That's one of the ones we recommend. And with that, right. so with like Dashlane, it, it, gives you two-factor authentication as well. So you store all your passwords there, 
but then when you log in, you still have to log in twice, pretty much before you get access to your own. So you still have to remember a password, a single password, at least because you have to type that in. It sends a verification to your email. You go into your email, you click on it, you get the code, and then you put the code in. Um, so my office, we use Dashlane, um, and the others that I put in the app, my tech person, those, those are the ones he uses. And he uses password um, managers all the time because he's not old school like me. Like I'm old school. Like I use a book because it just feels that like better control <laughs> could be a control freak issue, but it just feels that like better control. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, we drop the link for you guys to provide um, feedback on a session. We'd really appreciate if you can do that, as well as um, to take one of the Gleek micro practices on critical thinking related to cybersecurity. I'll pass it over to Kyla. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining, and especially a, a, a big, big thank you to Carrie Ann for enlightening us. <laughs> And not and and doing it in a very gentle and nurturing, non so, not so scary <laughs> way. <laughs> um, and you know we will have, as we always do with all the Gleek mentor meetings, um, a list will be sent out for all of us who are here, so we can all connect with each other on LinkedIn. And we encourage all of you to keep connected and stay connected with each other, with Carrie Ann, um, and of course with us. So um, we just like to end, as always, with our Gleek blowing a kiss. Um, and if possible, if um, those of you who are not on screen, if you wouldn't mind joining us, we would love to see your beautiful faces. So that's Kim, Vivak, Joy, Louise, Ozma. <laughs> well, our beautiful Ozma. We'd love to see you, and then we'll take a... Um, Screenshot picture. That's the group picture these days. <laughs> More cameras on. Would any? Oh, everybody's like leaving. They're like, yeah. <laughs> security, security. <laughs> Hi, Vivek. Nice to see you. Nice to see your face. <laughs> Joy and Ozma, are you, will you be? Oh, hi, Joy. Hi. So yeah, I'm in the dark as well. So apologies on that. So I think the Gleek logo will represent. Okay. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Everybody, shall we start blowing our kisses on the count of three? Yeah. Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> Did I hear the click? <laughs> yeah. Okay, awesome. Hope you all have a safe, cyber secure week <laughs> and life. <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Thanks, Gary. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.